Welcome to Compared to Who, the podcast to help you stop comparing and start living. I'm your host, Heather Creekmore. I hate to admit this, but I used to secretly obsess over my appearance. I thought it was part of my job as a woman to always look better, but never felt like I could be good enough. Maybe you can relate. God, in His grace, showed me a way out, and I want to give you all the tools you need to break free too. If you've ever spent too much time stressing over your looks, I get it. I hope you'll keep listening and find the same freedom I have. Here are three other things you should know about me. I'm a minivan driving mom of four. I'm author of the book Compared to Who and The Burden of Better. I'm a blogger at comparedtowho.me and you just may have seen my epic big fail on Netflix. If you've ever struggled with comparison or body image issues, Compared to Who is the show for you. I hope you enjoy today's episode and hey, tell a friend about it. Hey there, welcome to the Compared to Who show. I'm Heather Creekmore, and I am so glad that you are watching today. Today, my guest is Tracy Brown, and she's a dietitian, and she's part of this new series we're doing where you can learn what a dietitian or what a, let, let me clarify, what a Christian dietitian <laughs> can offer to you. So Tracy, welcome to the Compared to Who show. Oh, Heather, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm so glad that we're connected. And um, I think this time together will be pretty edifying for all of us. So I'm excited. Yeah. Well, so this is an embarrassing thing for me to share, but your name was given to me and I was cleaning out some of my, oh, I don't know, 1,200 messages that are flagged for follow-up. That's my uh, organizational system is red flag for (laughs) follow-up. And I was glancing through the next day and I was like, oh, there's that name. And you had reached out to me a couple of years ago and I never got back to you. I am so sorry about that, (laughs) but I am so glad we are able to connect now. And we had a great conversation a few weeks ago. Um, and I'm, I'm excited for everyone listening to hear and learn more about you. So would you start off today by just telling us your story? Maybe I'll talk a little bit about the professional stuff first. And if you want, we can talk about my, um, walk with Jesus. Cause it's pretty, probably just as extraordinary as the other stuff too. And I hope that gives some hope to people who've been all over the place and coming, you know, he calls us back. So it's, it's really hopeful. I hope so. Um, so I've been a registered dietitian, nutrition therapist since 2006. That's not the interesting part. It's really the part how I got there or not 2004, but 2006, I started, um, my working at eating disorder, private practice and non-diet private practice. But the interesting part about that before is um, I grew up with not really any personal worry so much about food or weight, though I did have it around me all the time by osmosis of like a little bit of good food, bad food. Mm. Um, and this was the late seventies, early eighties. So there's a lot of like very extreme things, you know, it's like people will go on diets, and it'll be pretty extreme and then they would stop. And this is what I saw around me from my grandmother, my mother, but I just thought it was dumb. I'm like, I don't know why they're doing that to themselves, but I knew they weren't happy and I didn't really get it. But those little seeds get planted very early. And I think it's important when we look at our own histories, like maybe it wasn't directed at you. Maybe you weren't the larger kid that was bullied. If you were the larger kid that was bullied, it was very obvious, right? That like you're, you're taught that something's wrong with you versus, you know, this is other people's sin. That's their problem, not yours. But um, sometimes we just grow up in these environments where there's just all this by osmosis, you learn, especially if you're a highly sensitive person, like, oh, it's not okay to like, this is the thing you should be afraid of is fatness. And this is a better way to be in this one, maybe or not feels like it, it gets more respect or power or love or whatever. So I started kind of taking from what I noticed that at least those were the belief systems around me. So it was just tucked in the back of my little eight-year-old head, like, Ooh, like having smaller hips is better and having a flatter stomach is better because they always complain about the opposites. And this is what children's brains developmentally do. It's black and white thinking, right? Again, that's just tucked away. And then as you go through puberty and go through high school, what happened for me is that like, again, it wasn't directly about, I think I have a bad body, but I need to always watch out for that. And that was enough to trigger eating disorder in me after a breakup, thinking that like somebody else had, it was just better than me. And this is why all this bad stuff happened in this relationship. 
And um, very quickly, you know, the enemy very, very quickly put that in me to like be really, really obsessive. And I already had some like obsessive compulsive stuff. This will, we can talk about that with some of my, um, my faith walk story, but I already had a lot of reasons to be a little obsessive compulsive and dieting was just a great fit. It gave me something to be in my head about to disembody. So I have to feel feelings. And it's what really it was about. So anyway, had a pretty rugged, ragged, awful eating disorder, late high school, early college. And God put a little angel in my life, which was a non-diet dietitian, which didn't even have a name for that in 1996. But she had just had an approach of like all foods fit. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't really, right now, it doesn't really matter so much what you eat. It's all about adequacy. So you can stop obsessing and actually learn how food works. So she didn't take it from a weight approach. She took it from, you have all the, this belief system about how food works, but is that actually true? I'm like, oh, you know, I was a curious, sensitive person. I wanted to like not be lying to myself mm-hmm. and I don't feel too guilty about that. So I'm like, okay. So I started eating more because something in me knew probably Holy Spirit that she was right. That like mm-hmm. being smaller, isn't the way to get people to love you and to like express, respect you or if you actually have power. And the reason you're so obsessive is because you're not eating enough plain and simple. So anyway, I had a really great experience with her and I thought, Oh, I'm going to college. What am I going to do? My therapist wasn't that great. So like, I don't love that. That that wasn't a good experience. I'll be a dietitian because all dietitians create this wonderful relationship. They listen to you. They don't tell you what to do, but that's not actually how it works. <laughs> so this is the professional interest here is that like, once I went to college, I went there, I'm like, Oh, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can learn about biochemistry and all that, but mostly when it comes to the counseling end of like how to educate people about nutrition, it was really weight based. There's nutrition in there and health based, but there's a lot of fat bias just was. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, I don't think I can do this in the way this is being educated to me. So basically what do I need to do to get out of here, get this piece of paper? What do they need to hear? But what I actually Mm -hmm. believe is that God made people really diverse and he made our bodies to run on autopilot unless there's some disruption around that to know what they need to do. Mm. So I kind of figured, okay, I'm going to have to figure out how to do work in the way that I learned, you know, five years plus ago as I did my recovery, or um, I'm going to have to find a new profession because Mm. I can't do it the way that I'm taught. So that was the beginning of my career and and, in learning, 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 basically unlearning a lot of what I learned in college about how to treat people and around food and nutrition and health, and then learn how to be actually, you know, I didn't know I was doing this at the time, but really listening to the Holy Spirit in Mm. sessions about what's really happening for people Mm. and the relationship with food and how to decode, I feel fat and um, actually what people's bodies are telling them and learn to trust and listen to that. Yeah. That's the journey. So here we are, you know, yeah. between so, 15 and 20 years later, Wow, how we got here. And so I've never yeah. practiced like normal. If that oh, yes. Sense. So let's, let's stop right there yeah. and kind of dig into that a little bit because mm-hmm. that was really, I guess, why I wanted to do this series and talking to you, I'm talking to some other dietitians that are you know, working in the same way that you're working. And I'll be honest with you. <laughs> and I don't, I may have told this to you. I told this to a couple of your, your friends. I had some dietitian bias or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Angst, you, you know, had some, you had some well validated prejudice, right? Right. Well, so like, and that's fine. Cause it's, it's, it's well-deserved. <laughs> Well, and, and so I'm coaching women and we are making like awesome progress and they are feeling free and we've been together for months and they're like, okay, so now what do I do with the food? Yeah. Well, this and this and this, but you know, I, I don't know <laughs> because everybody is different and that's not, you know, what I'm qualified to do. And so I kind of felt this like, okay, I need something next. But a dietitian, mm, I'm not going to send anyone to a dietitian. That was my bias. And when I talked to women about it, they were like, we don't need a dietitian, Heather. We know about calories. Like we have a PhD in dieting, <laughs> right? I That's mean, right. you know, most of my clients have been dieting for 30, even 40 years, right? They know macros, they know calories, they know fat grams, they know all the things, right? And my only experience, Tracy, 
crazy was I went to a dietitian when I had gestational diabetes because it was required. Mm-hmm. And I sat there with my nose turned up at her, <laughs> like, go ahead and, and try to teach me something about sugar because yeah. I know a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, and then when I went to a functional doctor for the first time, they gave me a nutrition consult. And again, I kind of rolled my eyes like, okay, I know what it means to eat healthy, but what you do is different. So can you kind of fill that out for me? Just yeah. explain a little bit more. So, I mean, cause you, you've alluded to it through how you're doing it different than you were taught in college, but what does that mean? What does it look like? So again, we, under, we understand that like all the cells in our body have their program to do what they need to do. And we often approach nutrition from our heads, macros, grams, just because we think something doesn't mean it's accurate to how our physiology works. So the, what we do is help people, let's say, look at your day of food, look at like how, when you started and when you finished and everywhere in between about how that experience was, what is the experience of eating? That way you become your own nutrition expert. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that, that the very basics aren't true. Like fiber is a good thing. Eating a variety of foods is a good thing, but beyond that, people don't need need macros. They really don't. They don't need to count grams of anything. If you pay attention to your eating, you'll recognize the body doesn't want too much of any one thing. Mm -hmm. There are times that you're really craving something fresh and there are times you're really craving. I had a box of mac and cheese yesterday for lunch. That was my lunch. I was like, that's all I want and need. Mm -hmm. Perfectly fine if I have that. Didn't feel like anything was missing. Another day that might feel like, kind of want something savory with that or sweet with that or Mm. sour with that. And you got to listen to that. Mm. Your body's telling you. Um, Now I know that can be when you're first starting this journey from like letting go of fears about fear, fears about weight gain, what the world thinks about us or what we need to feel safe and loved. We often let the world tell us like, well, this is how you're going to be safe and loved if you eat the macros this way. That's a mental construct that has nothing to do from the neck down of what your body mm-hmm. is actually asking you to do, but that can be in conflict. So we help people work with that conflict as well. Of like your brain says this because this feels protective mm-hmm. to try to get some needs met relationally. Your body's saying this, can you see and feel how those are incongruent? Mm-hmm. And we're going to have to find a way to get both of these needs met in different ways without trying to make it about if I could just get thinner, then everything goes away. All the problems go away. And you see how these are just separate issues yeah. from the nutrition part of things. Yeah. And to what extent when, when your body is fighting with your brain, yeah. I mean, when the end result is I just want to lose weight, but to what extent is that just not going to happen if you're constantly in stress and yeah. <laughs> frustration when your brain's saying one thing, your body's saying the other, I mean, is that part of what you're seeing too? Oh, absolutely. I work um, because of my background in trauma personally, and then all my training and trauma, it's like, if you're in a fight or flight, freeze or please, like this um, threat response, you do not digest well anyway. It's just, they're not compatible. Fight or flight means I'm running up a tree to get away from the tiger. Mm -hmm. Freeze is like, well, I couldn't get away. So I'm going to hunker down and slow everything down. So I don't feel the pain. Mm -hmm. No rest and digest and healing physiologically happens there either. So if you're constantly in this flight response, which is what calorie counting is, whatever you're doing, you're not getting health benefit that much from anyway. It's just, I call it a faux safety strategy. It's Mm -hmm. not real safety. It's not real health. It's something for us to do to disembody and distract from the real too much or not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so you do care about nutrition. We do talk about nutrition. Again, most people come to me knowing plenty. They don't need a lot of education from me, but they do need to learn and kind of become a professor of their own experience versus being like, well, I ate the wrong thing. Well, how would you know that inside? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, my head said that's too much sugar. So your head's in your, your GI tract (laughs) and, and who says, and what's your experience like? Well, did you get sick if you had that? Well, no, I just actually didn't binge. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So anytime there's like this grabbiness, um, binginess, obsession, there's a deficit somewhere earlier in the day, hundred percent of the time. It could just be mental deficit, maybe not caloric, but most of the time there's a caloric deficit too. That's like, well, of course you want higher energy food. If you've got a caloric deficit, it's always going to happen. That's Tracy. This, this is so good. (laughs) 
Are you tired of comparing yourself to others? It's time to break free, my friend. Check out compare2who.me online and you'll find a ton of great resources, blog posts, videos, and so much more to help you stop comparing and start living. And make sure you sign up for my exclusive email list while you're there. I send my email friends things I don't send anyone else. You can also find out more about my brand new book, The Burden of Better, How a Comparison-Free Life Leads to Joy, Peace, and Rest. If you're tired of battling comparison, friend, I wrote this book just for you. Check it out right after this episode, of course. So let's go back to the trauma part. And I know that's part of your story and part of your testimony. Yeah. Would you, would you share that with us? Absolutely. And I, it's, it's one of those situations where it's like, some of us have like very well remembered trauma. Mm-hmm. A lot of us don't. And there's something called developmental trauma, which is basically in these early formative years where your needs are supposed to hundred percent be attuned to and met to have secure attachment. A lot of times that doesn't happen for us, for people. And that's the, my, that's my story where it's like on the surface, everybody looks normal. Mm-hmm. Everybody's out in the world. Like, Oh, your parents are so nice and they're so great. And there's a level of that's totally true, but in their own, in their own, like your parent, my own parents' stories, like their parents had a lot of trauma, their parents mm-hmm. had a lot of trauma. So mm-hmm. nobody really knows how to do emotion. Like I'll just say do emotion. We don't yeah. do emotion. Yeah. Um, And that leaves you with a sense of like, I've got to handle this myself Mm -hmm. to not be too much for people because they cannot handle me, my emotion, which can lead to a sense of like rejection. So that spirit of rejection, which turns into self-rejection can come in. I'm too much. My needs are too much. So oftentimes what will happen, this is what happened for me is that you become this little perfectionist, have obsessive compulsive because you're always scared and you're always trying to you're always intuiting other people's needs, which we're not supposed to do that. You know, that's a little bit of a divination thing going on too. And, um, and you can't help it when you have this developmental trauma, mm. you become, if you're already highly sensitive, you become like highly sensitive to 10 mm. of like, how do I meet people's needs? How do I be good? Um, you do that. That just builds and builds and builds and every developmental stage, it just usually gets worse unless there's repair. So mm. I wouldn't look like a person like, oh, I have these big T's that I can tell you I can remember, but little T's is like, it's like, you know, death by a thousand cuts Mm -hmm. of like, I'm too much. And then you actually, you'll have moments where you try to be vulnerable and you get smashed, you get told you're too much and you just, it reinforces it. I mean, Mm -hmm. in our culture, again, we don't talk about feelings in a very constructive, productive way oh, well, just work harder or um, just get thinner or then mm-hmm. then you'll be good and everybody will love you and you look for external ways to deal. So I will couple that with, um, I actually do come from a family, on, I wouldn't say totally on both sides, but a lot of, and maybe people, when I say this, they'll know what I'm talking about, is a lot of secret society kind of stuff. And I know that sounds really conspiracy theory kind mm-hmm. of stuff, but there's a lot of oaths and vows that do create a lot of dysfunctional stuff on the and, and, and control and manipulation mm-hmm. that also controls you a lot. So you have there's some mind control in there that keeps you from breaking away from some of these family patterns as well. So I didn't discover that honestly until my 30s. I'm in my 40s now. Like, uh, yeah, I remember. I have some memories of this weird stuff that mm-hmm. nobody's gonna believe. But you know, that's part of the trauma too is recognizing, yeah, there's this is invisible and it's invisible on purpose Mm. that you're not supposed to remember these things. It causes dissociation and all that. So um, how that relates to the work I do is that because I've been through these things and I've worked through so much of it, you recognize, I started to recognize in my sessions with an eating disorder recovery. And of course that I'll say all that stuff was a precursor to my eating disorder as well. So Mm. I can do the food relationship stuff, the body image work, the, exercise healing work. And then after a while though, I'll start to see in sessions with my people, it's like the more here is, is invisible. So mm-hmm. that's maybe pretty qualified to like, Oh, I know what this is. Mm-hmm. And it kind of led me down this trauma training road of learning about the nervous system, how the body holds these memories that we can't always articulate, but it's real because you're mm-hmm. feeling it. And mm-hmm. I think that's been a missing piece is for, especially for Christians. If you don't haven't been encouraged to do this kind of work, 
you know, pray, 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 and, and trying to do all the work and seeing all kinds of professionals and you're still sick and taking forever for this eating stuff to recover. And like, what's missing? It's like, you might have some of this invisible stuff going on Mm -hmm. that you can't understand. Like, well, I know all the things, but why aren't the, why isn't this stuff changing? Because maybe there's some stuff on your life that nobody ever talked about. And if you do a little digging and research, you can find out. And Mm -hmm. yes, your body is is telling you your mind Mm -hmm. can't remember because it could have been fragmented. It could have been put compartmentalized for very good reason. Cause maybe it's not meant to be remembered, mm-hmm. but your body feels it. Yeah. So oftentimes you'll know that's happening. If you're doing this work with, let's say you Heather or me or one of our colleagues and you're starting to eat normatively and you're eating from hunger and fullness. And you're like, yay, this is great. And about week six, the bottom drops out. You feel like you're mm-hmm. crawling out of your skin it feels like existential death and angst. Mm-hmm. And I have to go back to all this dieting stuff because mm-hmm. that's been the lid for all this. Yeah. That's very, very common in people's stories where it's like week six, week, whatever. And it's like, I have to go back on a diet, Heather. And you're like, mm-hmm. wait, wait, whiplash, what just happened? Right. Right. Because you're having some feelings that have been suppressed. Some memories that have been not available till now for whatever reason, probably God's protecting you. Mm-hmm. And now it's time to deal with this. And if you go mm-hmm. back on a diet, you know, it smushes it back down and you, it will come back, but it's very common to want to go back to dieting, exercising yeah. to like fix the kit, fix what you feel in the container. The container is not the problem. Mm-hmm. It's just what is in it is too much. Mm. Yeah. That's really good. Let's flesh out oaths and vows because I think I know what you mean there, but I'm just not sure if that's clear. And what I think you mean there are the things like what happens in this family stays in this family or those sorts of things. Yeah. So it could be, it could be, I'll call it family call. Like this is Mm -hmm. the way we do it and that's Mm -hmm. it. And there's a hierarchy of Mm -hmm. behaviors and thoughts and patterns that are acceptable. And so when you start to break out of it, you are going to feel like like you're doing something really bad and wrong. You're disobeying. You're disobeying, you're disobeying. your family rules, right? You're like you're going that. against those authorities. Against that. Right. And there's there's um, consequences. Mm-hmm. And they're real consequences. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to be the favorite anymore. You're not going to mm-hmm. get the special treatment. You're not going to get whatever. So there's family stuff, but there's actual also real stuff that's out there. Yeah. <laughs> that, that have that you can go research these things that like you make vows that impact your family. Mm -hmm. you break away from that, then you're going to feel the impact of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So your testimony. Well, okay. So I've always loved God. And I think that God just put that in me because I didn't, I wasn't exposed to it that much as a kid. So my dad's because of his, I'll just say it, Luciferian um, vows and oaths. Mm -hmm. He's got his thing going on. That's you know, weird and secret. Mm -hmm. And then my mom was raised Catholic and put up, you know, we did Catholics. Catholic church. And I didn't have any problem with that. I didn't have any bad experiences with it. It gave me a little bit of, um, I think Christian light education, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But i never, didn't like, I knew God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. I got that as a kid and I was really hungry for it. Cause I think God made me that way. And just a spiritual sensitive kid. It just was. Um, but you know, I think about fifth grade, I'm like, how come we don't read the Bible? There's a thing that was a Bible, right? And I never got one. And we never talked about it in my little mm-hmm. Sunday school. And I'm like, I think I'm done with this. Cause I think it's typical for like a true seeker is like, mm-hmm. I don't get this. Nobody can explain this to me. So I'm out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was kind of the end. I just would say my, our, our father, the rest of my life until I was my later on, but that was about it of my relationship with God. I believed mm-hmm. in him, I actually loved him, but I didn't know him mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. So I had a very powerful experience in recovery because I got pretty sick with my eating disorder. And the thing that saved my life was um, laying in that hospital bed, you know, being threatened with two feeds and all those kind of things in high school, all the very cliche things that you hear about. Thankfully, most people's eating disorders aren't like that. Mm -hmm. Most people don't look like that or have that story, but I happened to. And it was like, I was laying there in that hospital bed beside this woman, we had the curtain butt between us and she it was an older woman. I think she was, I know she was really sick, kind of semi in a coma, but not really. Mm-hmm. And, um, was older and she had people constantly visiting her. I was alone, had no visitors. Mm-hmm. She was like in and out, in and out, in and out, people talking to her, praying over her, crying with her, mm-hmm. crying, but she wasn't fully there with it. Mm-hmm. 
And I just started crying when I'd been like day three, I was like, I'm not eating. I don't, you guys are just trying to make me fat, the whole thing. And by two day two or three of this, I'm like, I just started thinking like, she's had a whole life. She had all these people that are visiting her, loving her. And I'm not going to have that if, if I keep doing this, whatever this is, you know, I didn't choose this, but this is, this is going to be it for me. And I just started crying and I've never repented before. I didn't know what that mm-hmm. meant, but I was like, God, mm-hmm. I'm so sorry. I was crying and I did this to myself and I didn't need to. And I just wanted people to love me and I didn't mean to get here. And we know that God loves a contrite heart. Mm-hmm. So that was the beginning of the good stuff, you know, where it's mm-hmm. like, I was able to eat and it was very supernatural because I had no intention of eating. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to do it. I'm like, well, let me die. I just, I'm not mm-hmm. going to do it. And that was the beginning. And he was like, look, this is what's going to happen. If you don't, this is going to happen. You do. And part of it's this work I do in this ministry. And the other part is my, my life is gone and my parents are ruined and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. It was dramatic, you know, kind of thing, uh, moment. But in that situation where I was, it was a very, also very scary situation. I was 18 by two weeks. So I was in the adult part of this treatment Mm -hmm. place I was in and it wasn't any sort of treatment place. It was very, very much like, this is where you put unmanageable people, unmanageable Mm -hmm. people, drugs, Mm -hmm. alcohol, eating disorders, all kinds of stuff. And, um, it was very scary and lots of experimentation on people was going on very much like a movie. And I was Mm -hmm. like, this place is bad. I think there's evil here. This is scary. I'm going to have to eat one to get out of here and get a life and never return. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a scared straight thing. Plus I could have just like eaten and dissociated, but I didn't. I was Mm -hmm. like every meal, God be with me in this because I know you want this for me, this eating and you don't want this life for me. I know you don't. So I didn't really get much treatment therapeutically, but I got like the experience obviously I needed to like, this is where fear of fatness, this is the torture that is going to happen. This Mm -hmm. is um, the brokenness that'll stay with you forever. If we look for love, even salvation Mm -hmm. with our bodies, we won't get it. Even if you never get this extreme and get in this hospital, I knew this is what he was teaching me that this is, if you never end up in a place like this, your mind will be like this. You will lose your mind in your mind. So anyway, I came home after like got out of there and was just like, God was with me full force for about nine months. And then I went to college and then immediately the enemy was attacking me with like bad influences all over Mm -hmm. the place. And so he he handed me over to like, okay, so if you're still going to think that like thinness is the only way to be happy, then I'll let you to it for a while. And Mm -hmm. so I went through a really, really hard period of restricting and binging and over exercise for like five years and abusive relationships and stuff. So anyway, wasn't praying, wasn't reaching out to him mm-hmm. anymore. So he left me to it. And, but he still had my hand on me to protect me from really bad things that mm-hmm. could have happened. And how God does sometimes he let me get sick of it before mm-hmm. I started like, okay, I'd rather be alone and bigger mm-hmm. basically than keep doing this life. Cause this is not a life you know, there was some grace in there to put some good people in my life, like friends. I eventually met my husband and, you know, a lot of this was, it's really interesting. So it's like, again, I wasn't, my testimonies, I wasn't with him, but he was with me that didn't let me go off the cliff Yeah. because I think, you know, he knew when well, he called me yeah. even, and I wasn't in you know, all listening, but he didn't, he let me like, he let me dangle yeah. with a lot of things. So honestly, I ended up going back to therapy, like in my later twenties, because, you know, just like life is really good. I was married. I started my practice. I wasn't eating disordered at all at this point when I started my work, but it's like, I always had this nagging sense of like, no matter, like I I would work, work, work really, really hard to be good, Mm -hmm. you know, the best at my job and a good wife and good everything. And yet I still hated myself like flat out, Mm -hmm. like didn't have any, like any joy, any love, even though on the outside, everything looks good. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so like go out with therapy for this is, this is, something's wrong here, right? There's an incongruence. And so again, because of those vows and this backwardsness of like basic, some of these vows are about the, um, you be your own God and mm-hmm. you know, it's serious stuff. So mm-hmm. I have this influence in me and on me to like, I'll go fix myself. Mm-hmm. Like go, you know, it's, it's just like dieting mm-hmm. exercise. It's the same right. thing but for right. me. It was like, okay, well, I'll go to therapy and be the best at that. And we're going to learn all the school, all the, mm-hmm. the, the uh, modalities and all the things and all the self-help and all the self-love and all that. 
and I ended up in the new age. Mm. And you can imagine about as deep as you can get, like Mm. everything you can think of that's out there that you can mess with, I, I have. And he let me dangle just far enough to see, get high enough. In the, and this is how these false teachings and these false religions work. It says there's a hierarchy and a ladder. You have mm-hmm. to ascend and all the things. Mm-hmm. And you get far enough and they'll show you like, well, are you really ready to like make a deal? Mm-hmm. And it's bad and scary and evil. I'm like, okay, wow. I'm out. And that, that was 2017. Wow. And I've never looked back. I was like, you know, and I yeah. actually would pray in these little therapy meeting things I was in where it was like, um, there, you know, a lot of really, really, really good therapists also do a lot of new age work in there and Mm -hmm. you just don't know it, but I was pretty aware of that, which, which is what got me to this deeper stuff, um, for, you know, trauma healing and healing anything that you want to get basically. And, um, so one time this is the, this is, this was my turning point into Christianity for, for real. You know, it was like, we were having this little meeting as a group meeting, and the facilitator would, would pray to all the um, ascended masters kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Jesus included, God included, like mm-hmm. the God that I thought was the big G-O-D versus mm-hmm. all the little ones. So like, okay, cool. She prays to Jesus, prays to God. I know that. Oh, so their stuff is weird, but whatever. And one day I'm like, you know what? If this is not of you, God, I want to know about it. You've got to show me really clearly that this is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is not the real Jesus that she's praying to. You've got to show me because I need to know. Mm-hmm. So I did that little prayer as she's doing her prayer. And all of a sudden she she stopped her little mm-hmm. prayer thing. And she got a little dizzy and it looked like she was going to pass out. And wow. we're like, whoa. And, and they didn't know what was happening. The other women there. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh my gosh. And I had, you know, my hair was down on the ends of my arms and everything like, okay, this is what I thought it was. And all the stuff that this is my body feelings and the little bit of Holy spirit that I had in there was like, this is bad. This is bad. You got to stop. And that was, you know, confirmation I needed. Like I never looked back. I burned all the new age books, all the Brene Browns, all the stuff that's out there that I possibly had and like burn it, but threw it all away never talked to these people again, just stopped. And then I've been full force since like just deliverance, repentance, all the things, which has allowed me to like, at this point, you know, I took Timothy really seriously. Don't be ministering just because you're like newly saved and you're excited. Mm -hmm. Like it's been a long journey, you know, these last four years to like understand who's had me and called me and has stuff for me to do. That's his will and not mine. And all the times that I've been successful in recovery, like that stuck and that I didn't have to try so hard it was because I was doing it the way he wanted me to do it. Yeah. yeah. Not the way the world wanted me to do it. So anyway, at this point, wow. with my work, you know, like for those who are believers, Jesus is a part of it. And so far he's given me like, you know, lots of ability with discernment and mm-hmm. the, the gifts that we all, we all have our little gifts and right. you know, that's holding them back from like Heather maybe fully listening to you or to other people that like we have freedom for you like I can't do it yeah it's because a part of them is bound to something <clears throat> not right. because they don't want to so that's the kind of things that traditional one dietitians won't do non-christian yeah. dietitians can't do but a lot of times it's just we don't know that we need and he's revealing that to us like a lot of us these days so right so that's my story wow. That's amazing, Tracy. I got some chills there. And there's a couple things and we don't have a ton of time left. I f- first thought is wow on the the journey to new age, right? Because it is hard to scroll Instagram without seeing a Christian influencer tell you you need self-love and a Christian influencer tell you, you need more self-awareness and self, 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 self. So, I mean, that's, it's a battle that I've been fighting for seven years and, you know, have gotten some. That's why I shared so much much in in my testimony, because I did, I don't know how many years of therapy, 10, Mm -hmm. 12, Mm -hmm. these same messages, and you get some feel good from it. Mm -hmm. It's not saying that it is not to say that some of us isn't accurate. We do need to care enough about ourselves to care about ourselves, mm-hmm. like to take care, mm-hmm. but it cannot become an idol. We are not right. God and we can't heal ourselves. Right. We yeah. have our helpers, like Heather, you're a helper. I'm a helper. We're here to strengthen each other. And you know, I'm, I'm 
a truth and love teller for sure of like what's incongruent to not only basic stuff about taking care of yourself, but to God's word. But mm-hmm. I ain't, I'm not powerful. <laughs> I've tried mm-hmm. to be that. And I was taught to be that way since the moment I was born. Mm-hmm. And I had to repent for all that because right. there's a, a dark road with that. You don't really get where you think you're going to go. Right. Right. Okay. As we wrap up, I have to ask you, you mentioned this twice, the very beginning, and it's stuck with me that this is something that needs to be fleshed out. Mm-hmm. HSP, highly sensitive person. Mm-hmm. So tell us about that and the connection you've seen between that and eating disorders yeah. or all this so, other stuff. Yeah. I do believe if you look at the God made so many highly sensitive people, David was sense of his home ways and his laments and his music, Jeremiah. I mean, I so relate to him. He's just mm-hmm. always crying and like, Oh, these people don't listen. And I'll tell them <laughs> things and they don't get it. Highly sensitive people. It can come in all kinds of forms. I do think God makes people mm-hmm. more highly sensitive to just feeling things really deeply mm-hmm. and um, um, knowing the incongruencies, honestly, and what people say to you versus mm-hmm. like, you can feel, like, I think mm-hmm. some people, all people are that way in some way. We all have our, like our little BS detector sometimes. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But highly sensitive people are all like every situation. They see it like really bigly and broadly and what the, what the meaning of it is. They, they want to know like what the function, the meaning of it is versus mm-hmm. just taking things at face value. They just don't take things at face mm-hmm. value. It's like, what is this? Right. You're kind of like, just always like that. The problem I think is the enemy preys on that because a lot of people who are highly sensitive have a lot of discernment. They have Mm -hmm. like, they're just spiritually really sensitive and God Mm -hmm. uses these people, uses all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're so easily preyed upon because you can make them feel really bad, pretty easy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You can shame people really easy. So Mm -hmm. the thing with highly sensitive people as well, that it's it's easier to shame them and criticize, you know, get to the place of feeling relationally traumatized. They're more Mm -hmm. likely to attach to diet culture more mm-hmm. likely attached to the externals to feel less pain. Yeah. Just more prone to, oh, well, how do I fit in this world? They're always questioning, like, how do I belong? Right. 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 Um, if you talk to, and I think that the, the reason why so many people come to us, Heather, is probably there's some, there's been some level of like being shamed and othered and rejected mm-hmm. at a time when we are really vulnerable. Mm-hmm. with highly sensitive or not. So a highly sensitive person just kind of senses stuff, whether their physical senses more mm-hmm. or more their emotional sensitivity or whatever. So yeah. most of them, I would say 95 to 99% of my clients are highly sensitive people. Yeah. Yeah. That but, is, that is super interesting. Like I'm going to have to have a long conversation with you after, yes. <laughs> not today, oh, but yes. another time I mean, about that. Because- there's a, there's a, yeah. Well, there's secular people that study this. Um, so there's a scientific validity that there's a certain, sure. it, she, um, I think it's like Elaine Aaron's her name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Her mm-hmm. book says like 15 to 20% of people are highly sensitive. Yeah. Um, you can make people more sensitive with abuse and programming as well. Mm-hmm. So there's that. So you might see like, this. seems like everybody is, well, we've had lots of decades of being right. indoctrinated by all kinds of stuff that would make us vulnerable to being um, knee jerked yeah. to, to behave in a certain way and be sensitive to that. So, yeah, that's fascinating stuff, Tracy. That's, this has yeah. all been so good. Well, I would just love it if you would just take, I don't know, a minute or so. Is there anything you'd want to leave the listeners with yeah. some encouragement or some thought mm-hmm. or, or, or whatever your message would be? Well, all I want to say is honestly, God is good. God has got his hands on people who obviously believers, but he wants us to heal. He wants us to be well, mm-hmm. doesn't want us to be obsessed about these things. Um, he gave us food to enjoy, to be nourished to not be created an idol with the same thing with our bodies. He has something for all of us to be doing everybody's valuable. Everybody has like a, they're part of the body and he wants us to, to be strong and be equipped. And there's a cost to that, which is like, we do have to turn away from being belonging in the world, the way the world says we should. Yeah. That's, that's the only thing that you know, feels really hard. And what is the barrier to that? We have soul wounds. Mm-hmm. If we can work through these soul wounds and get, and you can, we can't do it all by ourselves. I've had so much healing just from the fact of like praying for it and having deliverance and like mm-hmm. being with other people that kind of get this stuff that it's like, you can see him subtly helping you care less about this, yeah. helping you be more hungry for him. He'll do that. If you ask, yeah. sometimes the barrier that I've had clients that they don't pray to be well, mm-hmm. is because they've got this wounded part. It's like, if I lose the, the thinness, then 
I won't be loved. That's right. their younger wounded part. And we have yeah. to like kind of be more of a witness to it versus still be it. We have to let him be our perfect heavenly father when our parents couldn't and our teachers mm-hmm. couldn't and the culture certainly could care less about mental, emotional well-being, let alone your salvation. Right. We have to understand that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for You're being on the show today. Where can people connect with you? Yeah, so I have a couple places. So tracybrownrd.com, just my website. Um, I do a lot of, um, I know it looks like, you know, Facebook Live educational recovery kind of videos, but really I'm doing a lot of ministering in that. So <laughs> everybody can get a little flavor of that, even if they're not a believer. So all the platforms, so Tracy Brown RD, you know, Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. And I also have a peaceful eating community where people, if they need community around this kind of thing, um, they're not alone in, in it too. And it, I make it as, success, as accessible as possible. So awesome. And you have some free gifts, I think on your website. Yeah. So, so if you go to my website and just go to free gifts, that's all it is. There's like <laughs> four kind of tools to kind of work through body image tools, kind of hunger and fullness work. Cause it's really hard when you know too much, mm-hmm. your brain knows too much about food, but you don't have a physical experience. You really got to dig in there to like, look at your experiences with food and see how, and fight, figure out how it's a match for like, oh, well, I ate this and now I'm hungry in two hours. I guess I wasn't full. It's kind mm-hmm. of a guide, little guide post to the, that kind of work. If Awesome. You know, yeah. Awesome. Well, Tracy, thanks again. It's great to have you. And you, thank you for, thank you for listening today. I hope something in today's episode has helped you stop comparing and start living. Bye-bye. <music>